everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Well, the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a job for me. Meet me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. He has inside jokes with complete strangers. Cuba imports cigars from him. Mosquitoes refuse to bite him, purely out of respect. He is the most interesting man in the world. Uh, welcome to Everything Old is New again. It is time. We are back and ready to roll with David Cohen, the most interesting co-host in the world. David, what do you say? Oh, I'm excited today because, again, we have an old friend of ours on uh to us, one of, if not the most interesting man in the world. Absolutely. Peter Weller is back. I'm telling you, he's appeared on more than 70 films and TV series, including RoboCop. You know him from that, the sequel RoboCop 2. He's played the title character in Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension in 84. And uh, one of my favorites, Star Trek Into Darkness 2013, was Admiral Marcus. He's won a Saturn Award for nomina- a nomination, I should say, for uh, RoboCop. Uh, he received the Academy Award nomination for 93 uh, short partners in which he also acted in television he's hosted the program engineering and empire on history channel which i think we want to go into a little bit today uh from 2005 to 2007 he's appeared also in 11 episodes of the fifth season of 24 he's also on the fifth season of the showtime original series dexter and uh, he was there for 20 episodes uh in the long-running show sons of anarchy dr weller also has been involved in the A and E and now the Netflix series Log uh, Meyer, which uh, was uh, he was a director and an actor there. In 2017, he appeared on the, the Last Ship as Dr. Paul Valak. He also uh, directed ep- episodes there. He's directed re- most recently many episodes on Magnum PI, MacGyver where he's also appeared in two episodes. And uh, 15 episodes so far and counting on Hawaii Five-O, just to mention a few, but that's not all. <laughs> he's also earned a Ph.D. at UCLA in Italian Renaissance Art History. He got that in 2014. And I want to dive into that during this difficult time that we're having now. We'll talk a little bit about uh, art and how we can all get into it. Uh, we'll visit that uh, subject shortly. Uh, also, but that's all the time we have for in today's exactly. show. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And it's my fault because you know what uh, it was the last visit was 2018 more than a year ago but i thought to myself now during this difficult time when everyone's sort of hunkered down and we've got the quarantine going and we're trying to keep our spirits up who better than to help guide us through the quarantine with entertainment thoughts uh, and uh, philosophy then dr peter weller welcome back to everything old is new again Happy to be back, Douglas. Happy to be back, David. Good to see you guys. I actually see you guys now. So, uh, talking to you over the phone. There's something to be said about the... There's something to be said positively about this separation of states called Zoom, where we get to look each other in the face. I, I hope that doesn't change anything that we will ha- see you again after today, now that you've actually met us face-to-face. Uh, <laughs> you're not offended by the yeah. way we look, because we, we have to look for radio, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, You know, at some point in time, we have to meet up in New York. You know, it's like I passed in New York a lot. I don't live there anymore, but we have to meet up, have dinner, a steak or something. I don't know, something That'd be great. Interesting. Yeah. That would be yeah. tremendous. We, any, we're available, so whenever you're in town, feel free. We've uh, got our contact. We'll leave it up to you. Um, we'll now, Dr. Weller, you're involved with, I'm just curious, we talk about, uh, talk about Zoom. Have you had any opportunity? This is difficult. I've seen some people do this. Where they've been able to communicate and play uh, jazz or play their instrument over Zoom with fellow musicians. Are you able to do that? Or, you know, during this time, what are you doing during the pandemic to keep your, you know, your sense? I've not played jazz. I'd love to. I'm going to I'm check in with my band. We're just about to play a gig before the pandemic hit and shut us down. I, I, I got to check in particularly with uh, the bass player uh, because he's all tech savvy. You, you know, uh, him and the drummer, Ryan Cross and Donald, Donald Bartlett, are, are, they're just 
Barrett, John Barrett, are very, very tech savvy. I don't know how to do it. Um, I have to teach a class uh, as a guest lecturer at a, at a high school here on Zoom. I've, I've taught there before about uh, Michelangelo and the action movie. I'll teach it to you guys sometime, but um, it's a fun, it's a fun class. It's, but I don't know how to do it on Zoom. He's got the PowerPoint. PowerPoint comes up. I mean, I know how to make the synthetic background of this Venetian. Uh, which is now a hospital, you know, with the Scuola San Marco. But, and by the way, speaking of most interesting man, this guy, Leonardo da Vinci, that's the Vitruvian man, that's the proportion of system of man. Maybe that guy was the most interesting guy in the world. If I had to sit down and have a dinner with somebody and ask him 10 questions, I think it would be Leonardo. You know, I just think, because he's a one-off. And, you know, people try to, like, the segue into Leonardo is interesting. People try to explain, there's a new book out on Leonardo. And even at the end of that book, they go, we don't know. The guy's from Mars. How do you do all that stuff in a lot of time? How do you figure out all that stuff? Right. I mean, it's just not the Mona Lisa and, you know, and soft focus. I mean, the engineering, the idea of moving water uphill. I mean, building a crane, the parachute, the guy tested the parachute. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, so I, I can't play jazz on Zoom, but I do a lot of Zoom uh, other stuff. So, I, I, I'd, lo- I'd love to. And when like you say that, you do uh, Zoom other stuff, is it more industry related, related to work, or social, or what, I, what's I the- do Zoom. I, I do Zoom. Uh, that's the thing is, I, I, you know, my, there's a writing partner and I are about to pitch a series. Uh, we pitched it to. We're also going to pitch it to Columbia, but we don't want to pitch it in Zoom because I'm more demonstrative, demonstrative in a room. And pitching pitching it on Zoom. I mean, maybe we should. I don't know. I mean, but I don't know if anybody's buying anything on Zoom. I don't know if they trust it. So, and it's more dynamic in a room. And so uh, we got a pilot made. I think I, I just that, that that's dicey. Uh, the other thing is that I'm I'm I, I grateful. I'm grateful. I got two two papers accepted to different conferences. Renaissance conferences. I got one. There's a new Machiavelli Society. Machiavelli. I was talking about Machiavelli before we started. I misunderstood his, his particular view of um, political interaction. That you know, the, as we were talking about, you know, that the bicameral clamor, the the, the, the hoo ha against two parties is a good thing, and it was looked down forever as a bad thing. It was only when one party is silenced. But Machiavelli is like way over my head. I took a se- great seminar on Machiavelli. I took another seminar in Machiavelli. I know just about how Machiavelli, uh, that political situation in Florence influenced art around the time of Michelangelo's David. I'm not a Machiavelli expert at all. I know he was jealous of Venice. And so I submitted this abstract to the Machiavelli Society. I mean, you with people who are like Pocock and Skinner and these guys and Pete Stacey. These guys are true, gifted, intellectual historians who study economics, war, politics, the idea of state, you know, uh, the idea of, of legislation. Uh, that's not my deal, but I was honored that I, so I was honored that this paper was accepted. So I got that. Then the 16th century society accepted a paper on my dissertation guy, Leon Batista Alberti, and I'm prepping that as a book and about to send that out to all these publications as a book, as a book proposal. So, and then I played music, and then I got to homeschool an eight-year-old. And, you know, and then I got to go, hi, darling, yes, darling, to a, a fantastic wife who's a powerhouse, but if I don't, uh, you know, I don't want to say I'm, like, uh, you know, beaten by the feminist order of the house, but I am. So, you know, I got to tread lightly on the eggs. Is that a new there. dynamic for you, with, with the three of you being totally, home all totally. the time? How, oh, I love it, man. It's something I love yeah. it, man. I really love the fact that I had an absentee dad who was a jet helicopter pilot who was gone in the cold, was gone a lot. And uh, I don't think it's like later in my life that I really get close to him. Uh, and I, you know, being my, and my kid complains that you're going away doing television and directing stuff. And you know, when are you going to stay here and just hang with me? And now I get this wish, man, and he really is hanging. And sorry, how old is he now? Eight. 
that's a great age. And Peter, I have an eight-year-old as well, and I find the same thing. My little guy would uh, act out a little bit at times when, you know, he loved school, he enjoyed school, but he came home and there was some frustrations and there was, uh, especially at seven years old, and it was uh, manifested in some activities, you know, some anger and so forth. And now we've, we've addressed this in many different ways, but I just I think it's interesting that now for the last month and a half, he has been so happy, so different that I, it, it dawned on me that this was in some way, you know, kind of, I hate to say fault, but some way my fault in that, you know, I, you, you push them away because you've got other things to do, which you, which is to work, to make, make uh, money, to pay for the mortgage and all. But sometimes, unfortunately, I was doing it, I think, at his um, expense. And now that I've seen the difference in him because he sees dad around more and more available and we're goofing around and having fun and whatever it might be, we've got more time to do these things. If I have to look at a silver lining, that certainly is a silver lining of what's going on today. And unfortunately, we're going to have to take a break for a moment, but we'll be right back with Everything Old is New Again and Peter Weller. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. And Peter Weller this week. We're having a great uh, time here talking all things pandemic and what's uh, the effect uh, thereupon. And we were just left off on how it had uh, kind of positively affected my son and looking for Peter's response. You know, Douglas, it's uh, I got to kind of put the put the binoculars on backwards to see that because I'm a man of distraction and uh, as Robert Bly the ex court lawyer in the United States did that great seminar like 25 years ago in the company of men and that men in the 20th century particularly the late 20th century had lost a role model because say in the agrarian society even in the industrial revolution kids went out and spent all day with their dads, they learned their dad's craft. You know, it doesn't matter. It was, it was like tube making with machines in Connecticut, you know, farming in Kansas. Kids did what their dads did. And then the, the go away dad, the corporate dad, the, the, you know, the media dad, uh, the nine to five in a bank or wherever, man. Um, the kid doesn't see the dad. I was amazed. I watched Robert Bly with Bill Moyers and the, the kid didn't see the dad on an average of 10 minutes a day, I was shocked. And then I thought, wow, I probably if you added up all the time I spent with my dad, it was maybe 10 minutes a day. Girls, on the other hand, spent more time with moms because the career mom, even though it was taken off, 70s, 80s, 90s, was not in full swing, you know? There were a lot more home moms with daughters. But the void, you know, a lot of life, the void, find, men find a, a, a a, a, a big brother, an uncle, a guy at school who is a hero model who fills that image as a, or that role uh, in place of dad. And, you know, that always, always stayed with me. My dad was passed away by then. He died accidentally in a, in a tractor accident on his ranch, man. And I think of him a lot. But now, when what you just said my kid had anger issues, so it's not like serious, but you know, acting out and pushing back and so forth, and not necessarily always kind way. And the funny thing is, the same thing is happening with like what you just said, man. In the last six weeks, he's a fun guy, and also he expresses himself well about his wants and needs, about when he's upset. We're we're playing, you know. Tickle tag, we run around the house, man, and you know, find each other without hurting each other, right? Without falling into a piano, whatever. And he lost it. He lost it. It, it was his turn. We were all drawing straws to be it. And he lost. And he says, wait a minute. That's not the way I wanted to do that. I wanted to draw straws. And daddy, daddy did it by hiding behind his hand. He says, yeah, but you lost. He says, okay, I'm not playing. And I remember a year ago, it would have been like a fit. And he just sat down and said, I think this is unfair. I'm going to my room. So, well, we just went, okay, let us know when you want to play. But it's amazing. Know, it's, a, that. it's a big difference, and I know I, same thing. I, same thing on this end. Uh, maybe too personal for the radio, but it's not. But it, you know, because I, I think a lot of people are experiencing this, where uh, it used to be 
let me storm off and throw something or run up the stairs and scream and whatever. Now it's, I'm going to express to you, I'm going to tell you what's up. I'm happy. I love myself. I'm not happy. I'm having a bad day, whatever. But they're more in touch with, uh, you know, this way and, and helping us to become in touch with them as to what is going on in their mind. We don't have to guess. Uh, and I, there's more, there's less uh, sign language having to happen, you know, less behind the scenes of trying to guess what's going on yeah. with your kid. You know, they'll tell you. Yeah, there's much... There's much more used in the Queen's English of communication. I'm amazed. I'm really amazed. Which is great. So, besides that, besides playing, uh, you know, tag, uh, are you doing anything else? And and I want to transition a little bit into two things. No, and and we could talk about others. But uh, while we're here, I want to talk about um, a little bit about some entertainment uh, movies that have been overlooked or people uh, just haven't seen because they're uh, older movies. Uh, number one and number two, I do want to get into the idea that there are museums doing virtual tours, and you can really get into and we'll get into the specifics shortly. But you really can get into a lot of museums that just right from the computer and enjoy so i want to get a little idea from you and i'll, I'll specifically uh, bring them out but what museums to visit and what to visit within those museums and why we have the perfect expert to do that here on everything old is new again let me if you don't mind start i'm just going to start with something fun here i'm going to throw out um three uh let's see how many i have three three movies just to start if you don't mind. All right. And they really don't have anything in common too much. I have a bunch of these, but pick one or two that speaks to you from this list. Now, these are movies that I think are overlooked that people may not be watching now that, you know what, if you have a family movie night, uh, you have an opportunity to watch with your family or yourself, uh, I, th I think these are worthwhile. So maybe if, if any speak to you, let us know uh, from your perspective and why. So first one, I would, I'm just going to throw the names out. Marty, which is um, uh, from 1955 with Ernest Boyd. Nine. Lenny uh, with um, with Dustin Hoffman, 1974, and On the Waterfront with uh, Marlon Brando, 1954. Do any of those movies speak to you, and or do you feel that any of those should be viewed while we're in pandemic? Uh, they should all. Sh <coughs> Pardon me. They all should be viewed over and over and over again. Uh, let's start with the person you said, Patty Chayefsky, I believe, wrote Marty, didn't he? Yes. Delbert Mann yep. directed that. Okay, first movie I ever did was Delbert Mann. The first interview for a movie I ever had was with Patty Chayefsky. I walked into a room for, and I was supposed to interview, I was still in acting school for the hospital, and there was a guy sitting there. And uh, I had just uh, auditioned for Joe Papp. I was hoping to get a role. This is before I got out of acting school. And there's a guy sitting behind the desk, and he said, hey, the director be in a minute. You want to come in and sit down? I said, sure. And I'm sitting with him. He says, what are you doing? I said, I'm acting school. I'm here to meet. And this movie. It's not oh, great. You went into the theater. I said, yeah, I think I got a roll down. Joe Papp. He says, oh, great, great. He said, uh, okay, do yourself a favor. Uh, don't talk to the playwright too much. Talk to the director. I go, I may mean, I ask your name? He says, yeah, I'm Patty Chayefsky. I went, holy. <laughs> I've never seen a, I didn't know what Patty Chayefsky looked like. Wow. A legend. He's a legend, man. And, and he's just kind of throwing this stuff away. And I had a good 30 minutes talking to him. And then uh, later on, the first film I did was with Delbert Man. So Marty and Ernest Borgner are the hero, man. I mean, that that movie about the, the particular, you know, something, that loneliness, that is, we, is, is the thing is the Welch, you know, the world pain of being a solitary guy and a guy who lives at, uh, You know, I got to say that one of my heroes, and he was a pen pal for Short, for a short time, and he was right during that time, was Saul Bellow. And I think that Saul Bellow is more than a novelist, he's a philosopher. Uh, I, you know, Saul Bellow wrote me a letter, the likes of which is like, when I would read Saul Bellow, it was like being on an airplane at night as if he was whispering in my ear of my flight, like he was only writing for me. But I think Marty is, uh, is um, you know, a, a, you know, a a co-ideology with Bellow. I mean, Bellow, if he's writing anything else, is writing about the isolation and solitude of the person who wants to belong in, in, in an urban space. Marty's gifted. Uh, the second one, Lenny, look, man, how do we live without Lenny? You know, Lenny Bruce, political humor, satire, sex humor, every single thing that everybody's doing you know, it's based on, I'd say two guys, man, as far as stand-up goes, that change the game of what humor is and what we can listen to. We're, we're Lenny and maybe uh, Richard Pryor. 
in my mind. And my God, there's a lot of Myron Cohen brought Borschfeld humor, you know, out of the out of that on the television. I remember watching, for, you know, for every Shea gets in the world. That's for you guys that don't understand. It's a goyim, like they understand. But Lenny, Lenny Bruce, I mean, and the stuff that he was arrested for. I mean, what are we living under a rock for crying out loud, man? You know, I went to New York. I mean, just not Lenny Bruce's day, but when I went to New York um, and the play Lenny with Cliff Gorman uh, was on, uh, they were still breaking heads in theater bars. There's a guy at the bar, Jimmy Ray's, Joe Allen's, you know, all these places going, cops! And subsequently, people, same-sex couples, couldn't hold hands, and they would just drop their hands. And they would walk these cops, rousting trailers, rousting any place that, that, that smelled like it was gay. And I think, and, you know, this is like, and you cut back to Lenny Bruce in the late 50s talking about the idiocy, the lunacy, the absolute hypocrisy of what it, we consider, we are talking about this before, a moral society, man. Yeah, where you beat kids in public, you know, until the, you know, Child Rights Act. You know, I grew up in a day where you could beat your kid in public. You could smack your four-year-old or someone, that was, that was fine. And Lenny Bruce was arrested for, you know, screaming out like that. One of the funniest guys in the world. And Dustin Hoffman, that's my favorite Dustin Hoffman performance ever. Hmm. And what a great guy Dustin Hoffman is, man. And I would have loved to have met Lenny Bruce. Man. I, I would have, I yeah. would have, amazing, amazing guy. So the last one, however, I consider one of the three finest films ever made. And, um, uh, didn't Bob Fosse direct Lenny? Yes, he did. Okay, so Brian Hamill, arguably one of the great poster photographers, film film still photographers ever, did Scorsese's films and and uh, Woody Woody's films and just everything. De Niro and Raging Bull, that poster. One of my oldest friends. Well, his brother is the great great literati. He's got two brothers who are, uh, are uh, journalist writers, Dennis and John Hamill. But Pete Hamill is a legend in New York for political writing, for all sorts of stuff. That's his brother. So I used to go when I was a theater actor, Brian's one of my oldest friends, we used to go to Elaine and all these places, all these literary type places. And I also go to these places with Ali McGraw, who was also a great uh, stylist with Vogue, long before she was a movie star and model. And I would sit, and there would be Fosse a lot of times. Man. And I would sit and listen to Fosse. I can barely remember a thing he said, but you know, I was just invited to sit, man. And Foster is a great friend of Pete Hamill's and a lot of other guys like Mailer and that. And a guy talked like a machine gun. He talked faster than Scorsese, Richard Dreyfus, Patty Lapone, and Jimmy Woods all in one room. Like, would, like <laughs> spontaneous combustion. Ah, oh boy. We're going to have to take a little break right here. We'll be back right after this. Number the old is new again. Peter Weller. <laughs> You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Hi, I'm John Billingsley, Dr. Phlox from Starship Enterprise. You are listening to Everything Old is New Again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen, masters of the art of radio. I can't wait to be on your show again, and I am not saying that only because you plugged my charity repeatedly. There we go. We're back here on Everything Old is New Again with Peter Weller, and uh, we're discussing and left off talking about the movie Lenny and the director Bob Fosse. But Fosse, like, the ideas, and he's always had a cigarette, the things coming out of his mouth, man, was so articulate, so fast, and so cutting. I, I was just amazed at the energy. And maybe the eight or nine times I ever was a pleasure to sit with him. I thought the guy was not of this earth. Not of, and to come out of dance and create that in cabaret and on and on and on. One of the great directors ever, and uh, and obsessed with this theme, the, you know, the, the bitch goddess called success, to quote Hemingway. The last movie, though, Kazan, brought me into the actor's studio, was a mentor, did a couple of improvs with him, never did a movie with him. Maybe the most single, incisive dude I've ever met in my life about the analysis of what people want and need. I, I, I venture to say that Kazan could walk into a bar and have a conversation 
which five people stand at a bar and tell you exactly what, what they were looking for and wanting in that bar or in their life. And it wasn't because he was a shrink. It's because he had the uncanny talent schooled by Harold Clorman to investigate, to operate, and to observe human behavior and wants and needs, which is what the Russians gave us. You know, it's a theater of wants and needs and not necessarily a theater of entertainment, which is not bad, but the theater of wants and needs, the representational drama that comes out of uh, Strindberg and Turgenev from Chekhov and so forth that the Russians invented and then clue you up on the group theater, you know, then Corman goes over and observes it. Out of that comes Kazan. And Kazan is like the granddaddy of naturalism. And that performance, I don't know, man. Look, you got Bud Schulberg writing it. You got Boris Kaufman shooting it. You got even Marie St. Brando and Carl Malden and Lee J. Cobb. You got Leonard Bernstein writing not the background music, but a symphony called what? The Waterfront Suite. That's performed by by the Berlin Philharmonic, that Waterfront Suite. <laughs> he writes a frigging suite as the music to a movie. If nothing else, people, right. you got to watch that for Leonard Bernstein. Now, Leonard Bernstein, Bud Schulberg, Eli Kazan, Brando, who Kazan said, how about this one from Brando? That performance is maybe, and even, even Olivier said it's one of the finest performances on screen ever. That's the finest performance on screen. I don't think anybody ever hits as many notes in one performance as Brando does in that. Uh, and by the way, um, you know, the misnomer about Brando is that Kazan said once, and he also says in his autobiography, that working with, as a director, a fairly good actress is infinitely more interesting than the so-called great actor because a woman does not care where her clothes fly before passion, yet a man will inevitably fold his pants. <laughs> Interesting. I, I, so I was like, said okay, Kazan, Ilya Kazan. Uh, and I thought, okay, okay. And is meaning that there's an emotional accessibility with women. Uh, there is. I don't know what the hardwired game is. Is that? Yeah, we make fun of women in the facility of wives to change their mind at will. And my mother always said, yeah, we're allowed to change our minds at will. We can change our minds whenever we want. I said, why is that, Ma? She's 80. So what gives you the right to emotionally just play havoc? She said, because we can't mug you. <laughs> and because we can't mug you, we can do that. We can right. say black is white, white is black. Yes, That's fair. We make you That's dare. Fair. That's great of my mother at 80 saying that. Because Anne's point is exactly that. The emotional accessibility, the willing to change, the willing to fly. Yet men are inevitably in love with the Iliad. They're not in love with the Odyssey, man. They're in love with, you know, themselves, dignity, pose, you know, vengeance, heroism, you know, the, 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 the you know, the idea, the image, man. Uh, to get, it's like what also William, William Goldman says in Adventures in the Strain Trade. You rarely get a Robert DeFall or Gene Hackman who can lose a scene so brilliantly. Because they said in every single scene, somebody wins and somebody loses. That's drama. It takes a brilliant actor to lose a scene. And William Goldman brings up that scene in The Great Centini with Duvall. And Duvall's a past master actor. I like to call him an acquaintance, if not a friend. But, you know, when Michael O'Keefe, who did his first play with me in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, Duvall comes back and realizes he can't beat his kid in basketball. What has he got to do? Bounce the basketball off his head and win somehow because he's failing as his ideas as a father. His whole sense of ego and male identity is going down the drain, is melting like the Wicked Witch of the West. Okay, Goldman says, if there's anybody less gifted than Duval, they would have had somebody write another scene where then he goes into Blythe Banner and explains that he was only performing for the kid to teach him a lesson such that blah, 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 so that this actor will not lose his identity in front of an audience, right? That's what Kazan is talking about most male actors. But then he said, except for Brando, who is actually a woman walking around in a man suit. I don't quite get that at the age of 28. You know, I got to kind of push that out. Kazan elaborates, you know, one of the great stupid stereotypes 
of Brando in a wife beater is yelling Stella, right? Flexing, you know, Stella, like macho it out. It's a, it's a, it's a cliche. And, you know, I didn't, there weren't DVDs. And then at that time, there were barely like you know, VHS is coming out then, man. But it says, if you see the movie again, he is not raving Stella with his biceps, right? He has got his hands over his head like a three-year-old wimp, like a child screaming it like a baby, like a grown-up spoiled bread baby. It's not that. It's that, it's that right? right? And that's the mistake made with him, that his great gift is, and on the waterfront, Douglas is the epiphany of it. I hate to go on and on and on. I should just go sem- seminal. Uh, I'm going to show you something in a minute. On the waterfront, there's as many notes as any man can hit in that man. Can I ask you about that just for a moment with respect to On the Waterfront? You talked about losing a scene. The scene that our listeners will know right off the bat, I think, even if they haven't seen the movie and they should, uh, is the scene in the back of the car with Rod Steiger and Marlon Brando. The taxi. Right, the taxi. taxi. And uh, my question is... uh, does Steiger, you know, lose that scene, so to speak, to Brando? And a better question is, why is that scene for us, on, on us uninitiated so uh, dr- dramatic and so important and seem to be so significant in the field of uh, filmmaking? I, I, I think it's the vulnerability of it. I think it's truly, I, I think of all, even the things that Brando did in, uh, like I say, in Streetcar, you know, where he's essentially a bully. Uh, or even Viva Zapata, you know, where, where, you know, he cries over uh, Anthony Quinn's body. But I think the vulnerability of that, I think that is the cornerstone breakdown of modern man in film. And the, the, the circumstances, everything is like, in the, as you're saying, the method, place, time, circumstances, relationship, place, time, circumstances, relationship. The circumstances in the relationship in that, and the confession in it is such is that what we all do, that there is disappointment. I mean, I think about that scene, I guess we will be right now, Douglas. There's disappointment in all our lives. We all know that. There's disappointment, man. You know, we're all not even Edmund Hillary and Mozart had some disappointment, had some stuff that did not work out that they wanted to. That confession of his, you know, I could have been somebody, you know, I could have been somebody, except I followed you around. You know, I did what you wanted, you know, because you're my brother. And and it's not blaming him. And the funny thing is, you could write that scene as you messed my life up. But it's not, man. I think that the the thing that, like, it's a shift in American cinema, man, that thing. And that's why it's a cliche and everybody talks about it, talks about it, talks about it. The scene in the back of the cab, the scene in the back of the cab. The scene in the back of the cab. I could have been somebody. I could have been a contender instead of a bum, which is what I am. And that confession is like, it brings American macho to its knees. It brings American ideology of of whatever male success, a post-war heroism to its knees. Ah, man, I tell you, that's what I get out of it. I get that, wow, I can now cry. Oh, we're going to have to break one more time here with Peter Weller. We'll be back one more section this week, and we will be back next week also with Dr. Peter Weller right here on Everything Old is New Again. These days, the news is full of teen suicide, drug and alcohol abuse, bullying. It's depressing and concerning, but there is hope. WWE Intercontinental Champion, Mark Marrow. Change Good Choice is a live presentation that empowers students to make positive choices and live their best life. I teach students how to live a drug-free life, prevent bullying, avoid peer pressure, and keep negative people out of their lives. We are defined by our choices. There is hope. To schedule a Champion of Choices presentation for your school or organization, visit thinkpaws.org. That's thinkpaws.org. This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. We're back here with uh, Peter Weller. We're continuing a discussion of 
on the waterfront in that scene in the back of the taxi. I agree with you, but it, certainly I'm going to take one step beyond, though. To me, as you know, neophyte watching that, it also is as uh, strong as like you know rocky uh, turning around and, and going ahead and, and winning uh, or, or exercising and he's going to win this match in that he's changing he has the opportunity to and he's changing his fate or is at least he's changing his life or he's going to try to change his life even in spite of that and he's not angry at his brother for for that mistake let's say that he, he had to he did that changed his life for the negative but now he's saying look i'm going to do the right thing i'm sorry uh, and no matter whether the court the cards fall where they may and i'm going to change my life so i think it has that to me it has that sense to it also where there's the disappointment and the emotion but there's also and by the way this is my chance i'm going down another road now yeah but he can't do that man until he breaks uh, you know, and it's self-awareness. And, and the, the beautiful thing about it is that there's two ways. Uh, another great uh, uh, icon in the theater and my teacher, as a matter of fact, uh, Uta Hagen, said, you know, there's monologues. Uh, when you are confessing something, it is either a, a the intent of it is to inform in which you've already you already know the thing or it's a search. So you're either searching, you know, it's like a Shakespearean monologue. Uh, you know, a guy comes downstage and tells you in Much Ado About Nothing what he's going to do. And then you got Iago saying, you know, you know, thus do I ever make my fool my purse, where he, where he tells the audience his plan. But then you got like Hamlet and another one going, trying to figure out something, you know, to be or not to be. So it's either information going out or it's a self investigation. And that is a self investigation. That's what that scene is. And you're right, he's going to go on to change his fate after that because that's the great end of the second act, man. Like Aristotle said, the second act in, you know, in a positive, what they call a comedy, but it's not a comedy, but something, you know, that wins instead of a tragedy. And the second act has got to be low, as low as you can get so that there's a Everest to climb in the end, right? And that is that end of the second act where I am done. And then he's got to climb out of it. Uh, another story would be that he confesses this and he goes away, right? And becomes an alcoholic. You know, I, that's that's like what most people's thing is. No, but that's that's a that scene is a turning point in the history of film, man. Uh, I remember I that's, I saw that scene when I was eight. <laughs> I, you know, I, I I never forget it. Right. Why do I remember it when it's eight? Why do I keep going back to that movie? I wasn't even an actor. I wanted to be Miles Davis. I'd go back to that movie. Right. I go back to the movie where he's sitting at the river where he's sitting in the bar trying to enlist a conversation with her. When he confesses with her with the with the with the train going by and you don't even hear what he's saying. And he's saying, you know, I was part of the murder of your brother. I you know, I don't know, man. It don't get better than that, brother. So I have to go see that movie here. again. Now. Yeah, you gotta you gotta <laughs> tune into lot. that. Yeah. It's it's great stuff. And I, I just hate the apology. Uh, uh, but listen, Douglas, yeah. Douglas, the, the the symphony of Bernstein music when at the end of it when he's walking into the longshoreman's warehouse, man, with all those guys that builds that music is like, gosh, that's like as powerful a music as a musical thing. That's like, listen to Stravinsky or Beethoven. Oh, it's like another actor in the, in the performance. That's for sure. Do you yeah. want me to show you this real quick? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. So anyway, Kazan, you know, named eight names in HUAC and then got chastised for forever. Though HUAC already had those names, but that's all right to think of it. Kazan he doesn't make apologies for it. He cast Uta Hagen, who is a great actress and a great teacher, but she was a great stage actress, and then she went into method, so forth, and she became like an, a, a basically a method actor and replaced Jessica Tandy in Street Turning Desire with Brando. In a class with Uta Hagen, you know, she never gossiped, but Deborah Headwall, I said, what was it like working with Brando? I said, man, Uta Hagen's never going to gossip. She's gonna, not going to talk about Brando. And she took this, she smoked a cigarette. She said, huh, Brando, exciting, really exciting. But it was even more exciting watching him to do it the two weeks before I went into the show. Anyway, next, well, I get up there and I, and I thought, oh my gosh, right? So later on, my friend gets me this. My dearest friend is an antiquarian book dealer. He sells the Gates, the Steve Bluestone, the Sawbone, or whatever. He gave me this as a gift, and this is or this is from Sotheby's, one owner, Provenance. I don't know what he paid for it. An original. I'm going to show you this. Street Guide in Desire. It's signed by. Here we Brando. go. Wow. 
Signed by Brando and Uta Hagen. Yeah, I see it. How about that? That's really right. cool. Wow. A, a one-off. I don't know what he paid for it, I, I, but he gave it to me, and it's like Uta, you know, force of nature. Force of nature. So we hit upon somebody that uh, is close to your heart. Let's put it that way with that, uh, you know, that did film. You, and... Did you study with Uta? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uda, Uda was, uh, I studied at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. I went to, uh, on a scholarship. I got out. I knew I knew just enough to not know anything. Uda's book, Respect for Acting, came out. I went to audition for her. You know, she only taught one professional class. 380 kids trying to audition for 25 spaces or 26 spaces. She turns me down. I go, I'm, okay, I'm not going to lose here, man. Tenacity, tenacity, my mother always said. And, uh, that's something that Uda said, by the way. Tenacity. Tenacity to get you through anything, man. You know, you can learn it. You can do it. You can learn it. So I go back. And she says it in her book, too. And I auditioned again. I studied with her off and on for three years while I was working. And um, I just want to tell you this real quickly, guys. It's, it's, it's important. She, there was, Christopher Plummer did uh, After the Fall, which is an Arthur Miller play done at Lincoln Center. The first thing over Lincoln Center, directed by Kazan. Arthur Miller was a big anti Hueck guy, wrote the Crucible, you know, the, the uh, Hueck did not, the House on American Activities, for those who are listening, who chastised a lot of innocent people, particularly in the movie business, did not get to the theater business. Okay, Uda was big against it, right? Like a big theater scholar. Kazan said eight names. Those names they already had, but he said them. <coughs> he never made apologies for it. Okay, when Arthur Miller does this play after the fall, which is about Hueck and McCarthy, he gets Kazan to direct it. Figure, go figure. T- 15 years later, 17 years later, Christopher Plummer does it on BBC PBS. Some kid doesn't know the history, asks Uda, hey, did you see Christopher Plummer in After the Fall? She whips on the class, kind of in psycho mode, and says, I, don't, I can't believe he got back in bed with him. I know what she's talking about. She's talking about Arthur Miller getting back, back, back in bed with Kazan. Nobody else does, but some people do. A couple of years later, I'm studying with Uda, Richard Burton. This is a great theater story. There. Richard Burton's going to do King Lear with Kazan. Kazan wants to see 15 actors, young actors for Edmund and Edgar. I'm one of them. Why? I got a lot of theater credits and so on, but I prepped this thing all night. You know, this, the bastard speech at Edgar with a box. He loves physical life. Uda Hagen teaches physical life. What are you doing in the room physically? You're not in a close up. You're washing the dishes. You're loading the gun. You're doing the property. I got this box. I do this audition, blah, blah, blah. I kill it. Kazan says, come here, come here, come here. Who do you study with? Who do you study with? And I know she hates him. She worked with him, but she hates him. I say, Uta Hagen. He says, Uta Hagen, I thought so. I thought so. And he said these words. He said, Uta Hagen, powerful, powerful woman, brilliant actress. Thank you. And he goes away. A week later, the whole thing is canceled because Burton is back on the wagon and dies out of all of them. Sad. Jeez. 20 years later, 19, dig this, man. I got to just tell you this. I'm invited to board of directors at HP Studio. They're honoring Miss Hagen. It's a big thing at the, it's one of the theaters in downtown. We go to this big dinner. She's sitting at the end of the thing. And somebody in this board of directors brings up Ely Kazan, man. You know, they don't know. And all of a sudden, I see Miss Hagen stop. She's five people away from me. This is in 1997, 1996. And, uh, I'm a made guy. And, uh, she's just, I can see her glaring. And all of a sudden, I just decide to say, I said, Miss Hagen. Yeah, I said, uh, I don't know if you know it, but when I was studying with you after that, I became a member of the actor's studio under Kazan. Really? And no, I did not know that. I said, <laughs> yeah, and I did improvs with the Kazan. But I want to know. I want you to know. I could see this going south. Everybody's now like, you know, this is honoring her and you're bringing it down. Well, I, one of the great mitzvahs I ever did, guys, ever, ever, man, is that I said to her, I said, while I was studying with you, this is a, a, a region, an epic of theater and film that people are still writing about there. Hueck, right? The destruction of careers and whatever. So I said, and she's 85. I said, well, I have to tell you, while I was studying with you, I auditioned for him. You did. I said, yeah, I auditioned for blah, blah, blah. And he, I did, I worked all night on a box in a chair and he did the edge of speech. And, stuff, and he sat me down and he said, who do you study with? And I said, Uta Hagen. And he said, I, I knew it. I thought so. I knew it. And he said, this Miss Hagen. He said, Uta Hagen, powerful. This is a direct quote. Powerful, powerful woman. Brilliant actress. You can hear a pin drop at this table of 20, <laughs> 20 30 people there. And she looks at me, and I'm like five, two people away from her, and she goes, did he say that? I said, Ms. Hagen, that's what he said. And then, thank you. I walked away. The show never happened because Burton went back on the bottle. But that's what he said. And her, I think 40 effing years dropped off that woman's face, man. Wow. 
And she said, thank you. Thank you for that. And that's all she said. And I, I think <laughs> I got to do one of the great mitzvahs. Store, Peacemakers. Yeah, mitzvahs ever, man. Right, right. That's amazing. That's great stuff. Uh, <laughs> we're here with Peter that's Weller. We're talking behind the scenes. We're talking uh, in front of the camera, behind the camera. Things that you really should uh, try to get involved with a little bit here uh, at the date uh, that we're in with this little pandemic going on. And uh, we'll get through it. But uh, those are some movies that you really should get involved with. We'll be back uh, next week to talk all things uh, uh, pop culture with uh, Peter Weller, David Cohen. Come on back next week. Everything old new again. Here with uh, John Billingsley, and we're talking about the Hollywood Food Coalition. John, what is this? Well, I'm the president of the board. We serve a hot, nutritious five-course meal to hungry men, women, and children seven nights a week, 365 days a year. Been doing it for 33 years. We distribute clothing and shoes and blankets and backpacks and you name it. And we help people access a huge array of other services from partner groups. And if you'd be interested in making a donation, hofoco.org, three bucks, buys a hungry person a great five-course meal. H-O-F-O-C-O dot org. You've been listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's pop culture entertainment talk show. Find us on the web at everythingoldisnewagain.biz. That's dot biz. See you next week. Same bad time, same bad station.